we going back into women class class when we talk yeah. about that situation. Both inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضاه وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد So inshallah تعالى this being the week before the Eid inshallah تعالى we're going to continue with the um, sisters class as normal Today, next week, as we mentioned, there will be uh, no classes for the weekend. Uh, so as to give everyone time to celebrate the Eid with their families and their loved ones, inshallah ta'ala. So we're going to be beginning a new chapter in the book today. But before we get to that, we wanted to address um, an issue that was brought up uh, last week. And that was basically a question concerning, um, you know, visiting visitations or daily visitations, whether it be from family, from the children, uh, and so forth, and you know, how that relates to the family life between the husband and the wife, and how this can in some cases cause friction between the husband and the wife, so we wanted to give some guidelines from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what the understanding of the Salaf concerning this, um, and so we have the, the authentic hadith uh, from Jabir ibn Abdullah رضي الله تعالى عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال في خطبة حجة الوضاء that Jabir ibn Abdullah رضي الله عنه he narrated that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said as part of his uh, khutbah as part of his sermon, sermon on the farewell hajj the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he said فاتق الله في النساء so fear Allah with regards to the women right this is an advice to the men Fear Allah with regards to the women. فَإِنَّكُمْ أَخَذْتُمُوهُنَّ بِأَمَانِ اللَّهِ Because you have taken them as a trust from Allah. Right? The wives that you have taken are a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاسْتَحْلَلْتُمْ فُرُوجَهُنَّ بِكَلِمَةِ اللَّهِ And having in- intimacy with them, having intimacy with your wives, this is something that has become lawful for you by the word of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. He said, وَلَكُمْ عَلَيْهِنَّ أَلَّا يُطِئْنَا فُرُوشَكُمْ أَحَدًا تَكْرَهُونَهُ And he mentioned that your right over them is that they are not to allow anyone who you dislike to sit on your furniture. Right? This is for the women. That the rights of the men, the rights of the husband over the women are that they should not allow anyone that you dislike to sit on your uh, on your furniture. And he mentions, And then the Messenger of Allah, he said that if they do that, if the women do that anyway, then uh, strike them, but in a manner that does not cause injury or leave a mark. Right? And I wanted to clarify when we mentioned this, this is the authentic hadith that is found in the Sahih Imam Muslim. And we're not, you know, mentioning, we're mentioning this because this was the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're not promoting, you know, spousal abuse and physical abuse and things of that nature. As the Messenger of Allah said that this is a strike that does not leave a mark, it doesn't cause a bruise, it doesn't, you know, cause pain. But it's a disciplinary measure, right? When the women allow people to come into your house and sit on your furniture that you dislike. وَلَهُنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ رِزْقُهُنَّ وَكِسْوَتُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and the women, they're right over you, they're right over the husband, is that you should provide for them and clothe them in a manner that is good, that is ma'roof, right? Good and reasonable, right? Not that you, you know, live as a, as a poor person yourself and you don't provide for your family and your, you know, family doesn't have proper shoes, they don't have proper clothes and so on and so forth, right? This is their right over you that you provide them, you provide for your family in a manner that is good and reasonable, so the shahid, the, the point that we're mentioning with regards to this hadith is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that your right is that they do not allow anyone that you dislike to sit on your furniture, right? To enter your home and sit on your furniture. Also, we have the authentic hadith that is found in the Sahih al-Bukhari Muslim from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. 
uh, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يحل للمرأة أن تصوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذني The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that it is not lawful, right? It is not lawful for the woman to fast while her husband is present without his permission. This pertains to the optional fast, right? Not the obligatory fast. The obligatory fast she's going to do anyway, and the husband is going to be doing them along with her, right? But this, this pertains to the optional fasts. That the, it is not lawful for the woman to uh, undergo a, a, law, a uh, optional fast without the permission of her husband if her husband is present, right? If the husband, for example, he's traveling for a period of time, and she's home by herself and she chooses to uh, do optional fasts and so on, that doesn't affect the husband in any way, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. But if the husband is present with her, then she seeks the permission of the husband before she does optional fast, right? Why is that the case? What could be one of the reasons? Uh, yeah. Intimacy. Right? The husband may want to be intimate with her, right? And she can't do that when she's fasting, right? So she gets the permission for, from the husband before she does optional fasts. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَلَا تَأْذَنْ فِي بَيْتِهِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ And she does not allow anyone to enter his home except with his permission. Right? She does not allow anyone to enter into his home except with his permission. Now we have to you know, talk about some details with regards to these two narrations. So there's some, some detail that is required. And the ulama of the past, like Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, he quotes from Al Imam Al Nawawi who said, "Fi hadha al hadith ishara ila annahu la yuftat ala zawj bil uh, bil idn fi baytihi illa bi idnihi." Uh, Imam Al Nawawi he said that this hadith indicates that the wife should not neglect the right of the husband to not let anyone into his home without his permission. Right? This is not something that she should overlook. Wa huwa mahmul ala ma la ta'lam rida zawj bihi. Right, and this does not refer to uh, those situations where she does not know uh, whether her husband would would uh, would approve or not. Rather, right? she seeks his permission. As for if it's a person who she already knows that her husband has no problem with that person coming into the home, then there's no problem with her letting him into the home. Right. الضيفان موضعا معدا لهم سواء كان حاضرا أم غائبا like for example if someone is known to regularly visit the home and that's their that's their custom and within the home they have a particular place that has been set aside for the guests like a guest room or something you know that's the area where they host the guests and this is permissible for her to let that person you know visit as they are customarily customarily do that anyway, طيب. So they have an area in the home where they normally host guests, and they have a particular guest who visits them often. And she knows that her husband is okay with that person visiting. There's no problem with her doing that, uh, regardless of whether the husband is home at the time or not. فلا يفتقر إدخالهم إلا إذن خاص لذلك وحاصله أنه لا بد من اعتبار إذنه تفصيلا. Right, and so as long as this is not someone who requires a special permission from the husband to be visiting, then it is allowed for her to allow that person to visit the home. Right, this is for guests in general. Now we also have the issue of what about if it's relatives, right? What about if it's relatives of the of the wife or the husband and so forth? So the scholars have a couple of different positions with regards to this issue. Uh, the scholars of the Hanafi Madhab and the Maliki Madhab, they're of the view that the husband, firstly, he should not prevent the wife's parents from visiting her once a week. Right? Notice how they said once a week, not every day. Right? That the husband should not prevent the wife's husband or the wife's parents from visiting her once a week. And likewise, he should not prevent her other mahram relatives, right? Like, for example, her brothers, you know, her sons, uh, and so forth. That she should not prevent them from visiting her once a year, right? Once a year. And the same <coughs> applies to her children. 
even if she has children from a previous husband, that he should not allow, uh, he should not prevent them from visiting her uh, once a day if the children are sigar, if the children are young, right? They're meaning they're, they're children, right? We're not talking about the children that are grown. We're talking about the ones who are still young, right? That if they're still young, the husband should not prevent them from visiting their mother once a day, right? Keep in mind, they're, they're children. They're not grown men and women, right? Then also they mentioned that if, if he believes that her parents will corrupt her, right? If he believes that her parents will corrupt her. And this is something that we should keep in mind, especially, you know, those of us who have relatives and parents who are non-Muslims. Because the thing that we have to keep in mind and the thing that, that you know, we have to be real and we have to accept is that when you have relatives and you have parents who are non-Muslim, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of our relatives and our parents to Islam. Ameen. But when you have parents and relatives who are non-Muslim, no doubt you have a natural love for them that Allah has placed in your hearts because that's your, that's your blood, right? Those are your relatives, those are your parents. So you're naturally going to have a love for them in your heart. And we know that in our religion we have been commanded to maintain the ties of kinship, right? So we don't tell anyone to boycott their parents or to you know, boycott their relatives and their families and so on and so forth, right? But that we allow you know, uh, interaction with them to an extent, right? Just like everything else in the religion, you know, we do everything in moderation. We don't go to extremes. So they mentioned, this is the, the, the ulama of the Hanafi madhab and the Maliki madhab. They mentioned that the, the husband should not prevent her parents from visiting. However, if he believes that her parents will corrupt her, right? And this is especially pertinent when her, when her parents are non-Muslims. Because the non-Muslims, even though they're your parents, and even though they may think that they want what's best for you, and that they, they, they want you to be happy, but their idea of what's best for you and their idea of, of your happiness is misguided, right? Because they're not judging by the book of Allah and the sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're judging by what they believe to be happiness and what they believe to be good, right? So this is something that you have to understand and you have to accept, right? That because of the fact that they're not Muslim and because of the fact that they are not upon the Qur'an and the sunnah, their ideas of good and bad are going to be misguided. So if the husband thinks that the parents are going to corrupt his wife, then uh, what he should do, what they mention is that he can uh, hire or appoint another Muslim woman who the husband trusts to keep an eye on those interactions. Right? He can, he can hire another Muslim woman to keep an eye on those interactions. Not that he's suspecting his wife of doing you know, anything inappropriate, but because it's the, it's the parents who may try to corrupt her or to dissuade her, and he can have another pair of eyes on that situation to you know, make sure that someone's not trying to misguide his wife or you know, trying to you know, cause some friction in the relationship and so forth. Right? These are things that are real and, and have to be done and that we have to think about. Right, because this is this is a situation that many of us today are facing, where we have relatives, and again, you know, our religion does not command us to cut off from relatives. Rather, we're we're commanded to keep the ties of kinship. But at the same time, we also have to maintain our religion, and we have to maintain the integrity of our marriages, and and those things are going to be very difficult to maintain if we fall under the influence of non-Muslim relatives or non-Muslims in general. Likewise, the, the, the Hanabila, the scholars of the Hanbali Madhab, they're of the view that the husband does not have the right to forbid her parents from visiting her, right? Because we've been prohibited from severing the ties of kinship. However, the Hanbali uh, scholars mention that if he knows, based on experience, that they're going to cause some harm to her or some corruption to her, then in that case it becomes permissible for him to forbid uh, her parents from visiting her. Play. So this is something that you know we we have to look at carefully, right? These rules are not cut and dry, right? We have to look at the situation to situation, you know. And and many of us, and this this is not even, and I don't mean to just put the blame on non-Muslim parents. Unfortunately, many of us have Muslim relatives who are just as corrupt. Wallahu al-musta'an. Allah subhanahu wa taala guide us and them. I mean. 
You know, many of us, I mean, I'm looking at my own extended family. Many of us have Muslim relatives who are into all the same things, right? It's just that they, you know, they say the Shahada and they claim Islam, but in their interaction and in their daily lives, right, they, they are just as corrupt. Wallahu musta'an. Tayyip. And so, you know, we remind ourselves of the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the best of you are those who are best to their families. This hadith is found in the Sunan of At-Tirmidhi and it was authenticated by Al-Albani. So, these situations when it comes to people visiting the home, you know, these are situations that have to be looked at carefully by the husband and by the wife. And the primary concern has to be the preservation of Islam, the preservation of our adherence to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. You know, I know some families are more tight-knit than others, right? I come from a, a culture where the families are generally very tight-knit, right? And the, the parents and the children, even after the children are grown and have their own homes, the children will visit the parents regularly. I've never heard of anyone visiting the parents every single day. That was new to me, right? But they'll visit maybe once a week, or once every every few days, right, when the families are living close together and so forth, and they'll they'll come over, for example, it's unannounced, no phone call, no nothing. They'll, they'll just show up, they'll show up, and they'll hang out. And then if it's time for lunch, or it's time for dinner, they'll stay for dinner, they'll stay for lunch. That's something that in that particular culture, that's you know, it's accepted, and it's that's just how they they do it. Right? I'm not saying that everyone has to do this. I'm just giving you an example that, you know, I, I understand this because I come from a culture where families are generally very tight knit, right? But I've never heard of you know, any any family where the children are grown and have their own homes and stuff, but they're coming to visit the parents every single day. That, I mean, in my mind, that seems to be a bit, you know, extreme and unnecessary. And Allah wa ta'ala knows best, you know. And then secondly, the other thing that we have to be, we have to realize is, you know, we also have to take a look at the condition of our own home and our home environment, right? If If as Muslims, if we're in a home environment, that is conducive to what the non-Muslims want to do, whether it's relatives or otherwise, right? If it's conducive to how they entertain themselves and how they spend their time and the things that they talk about, they're going to want to come over more, right? Because you're allowing them to do things. If we have things in the home that are going to be entertainment for the kuffar that they can, you know, hang out and entertain themselves, naturally they're going to come to your home more, right? They may spend your money, Right, not to spend their own, so they'll just look at it as a free ride, right? And I don't want to go into to details, but you all know, you know, what I'm talking about. But if you have a home that is that is upon the Quran and the Sunnah, and those non-Muslims, whether they're relatives or not, if they know that every time they come over to your house, they're going to have to listen to Quran, right? The Arabic and the English, right? You can find translations where you have the ayat in Arabic. And and uh, and uh, the translation along with it, right? If they know that every time they come into your home, they have to listen to this Quran, and it's going to be played loud on loudspeakers, right? And this is this is what the activity goes on in the home, right? If they know that every time they come to your home, they're going to have to listen to some some you know fiery lectures from from Abu Uwais giving dawah to the Christians and whoever else, and that's the activity because this is your home, right? At the end of the day, you run what happens in the home, right? And if they know that if they come over right now, you know, right now is Ramadan, we're fasting, and they shouldn't expect any food until after Aftar time. Nothing for them to eat, no snacks, no nothing, right? Because this is a Muslim home, we're fasting right now, we're not eating. So, you know, when you come to our home, you have to come with that understanding, right? That you're coming to a Muslim home, we adhere to the Quran and the Sunnah, right? When you do these things, one of two things are, are going to happen. Either over time, they're going to become more respectful and more interested in the religion of Islam, Allah will guide them, and bi'idhnillah, by the permission of Allah, they will also accept Islam, or they're just going to decide, you know what, this ain't fun anymore, we're going to go somewhere else. Right? But it depends on you, and how you conduct yourself in the home, and what your home environment is like. Right? That goes for any any visitors, relatives or otherwise, Muslims or non-Muslims. Right? Allah wa ta'ala knows best. So, I mean, that's what I would advise with regards to that particular situation. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala knows best. Tayyib. So what we're going to do today, we reached Al-Fasl Ar-Rabi' the fifth, uh, or the, the fourth chapter, afwan, in the book of Sheikh Salih bin Fawzan, Al-Fawzan Tanbihat Ala Ahkam Takhsasu Bil-Mu'minat. 
And so today we're beginning the chapter on Ahkam Takhtasu bil Libas wal Hijab. The rulings and regulations pertaining to the women's clothes and their hijab. Right? The women's clothes and their covering, right? Their their hijab. Uh, and so he says, Awalan, Shifatul Libas Ashari Lil Muslima. The section that we're going to cover today is the description of the legislated clothes for the Muslim woman. Right? The description of the legislated clothes for the Muslim woman, how the Muslim woman's clothes should be. And so he mentions a number of points. Firstly, Yajibu an Yakunu Libas al Marat al Muslima. ضافياً يستر جميع جسمها عن الرجال الذين ليسوا من محارمها. The first point is that it is obligatory that the clothes of the Muslim woman they be ضافياً they be you know ample and abundant. There's a lot of cloth involved, right? To the point that they cover her entire body from the men who are not محرم for her. Right? Meaning the men who she is allowed to marry, not her. Father, not her sons, not her brothers, and so forth. Right? The clothes should be ample, such that they cover her entire body, from the men who are not mahram to her. And he says, "Wala takshifu li maharimha illa ma jarat al aada bi kashfihi min wajhiha wa kafeeha wa qadamiha." Right. So the we mentioned that it is obligatory upon her to. Have clothes that are ample so that she is not, uh, you know, cover her entire body from the men who are not mahram for for, uh, for her. Then, with regards to the men who are mahram to her, right, like her husband, her father, her brothers, and so forth, for the men who are mahram for her, she should uh, not uncover anything except that which is normally or customarily uncovered. And the Sheikh gives the example like her face and her hands and her feet, right. Those are the things that she should uncover, uh, that she can uncover in front of her mahrams. Right? This is we're not talking about when she's being intimate with her husband. That's a whole different discussion. We're saying in general in the home when she's in the presence of her father or her husband or her brothers. Right? She should she can uncover the the face, the hands, and the feet. Right? Some of the some of the Muslim women and unfortunately the Muslim men they have this. You know, strange understanding that comes from the West and doesn't come from Islam. That when the Muslim woman is inside of her home, she can dress all kinds of ways and uncover all kinds of ways because she's you know in front of her maharam. And this is something that is not done in the religion of Islam. And this is something that is far away from the uh, the humility and the modesty and the shyness that our religion commands of us. Right. So even when the woman is in the home, she should generally be covered, have her entire body covered. But if she's in the presence of the men who are mahram for her, she can uncover her face, she can uncover her hands and her feet. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala knows best. Number two. أَنْ يَكُونَ سَاتِرًا لِمَا وَرَاءَهُ That the, the clothes that she wears, they should actually cover and conceal what is behind them. فَلَا يَكُونُ شِفَافًا يَرَى مِنْ وَرَائِهِ لَوْنَ بُشْرَتُهَا so they should not be clothes, for example, that are sheer or see-through, such that you can see the color of her skin beneath those clothes, right? Sometimes women have, you know, these clothes that are like, you know, they're sheer or see-through. So even though technically she's covered, but in reality she's not covered because you can see through the clothing, right? So the covering has to be opaque, right? That it actually covers her body. Number three. أَلَّا يَكُونُ ضَيِّقًا يُبَيِّنُ حَجْمِ أَعْضَائِهَا Number three, that uh, the clothing should not be uh, tight-fitting, such that it exposes the shapes of her limbs. Right? The clothing should not be constricted or tight-fitting, such that it exposes the shape of her limbs, right? her arms and her legs and so forth. And uh, Shaykh Salih al-Fawzan, he reminds us of the hadith from the Sahih al-Imam Muslim, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, Sinfan min ahl nari lam arahuma. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that there are two groups of people in the fire of hell that I have not seen. He said, Nisa'un kasiyat ariyat, ma'ilat mumayilat. 
رؤوسهن مثل أسنمة البخت لا يدخلن الجنة ولا يجدن ريحها The Messenger of Allah, he mentioned that the first group are those women who are clothed but naked. And they have evil tendencies and they incline towards evil. And their heads have a uh, you know, a, a bump on it that resembles the hump of the, of the bukht camel. Right? This is a hadith that we mentioned before. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said about these women that they will not enter the jannah and they will not even smell the fragrance of jannah. That's the first group. The second group that he mentioned was رِجَالْ مَعَهُمْ سِيَاطْ كَأَذْنَابِ الْبَقَرْ يَضْرِبُونَ بِهَا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ The second are the men who have uh, with them whips that are like the tails of cows. And they strike the servants of Allah with these whips. That was the second group. All right, so the shahid, the point from this hadith is the Messenger of Allah وسلم, mentioned those women that are Clothed, but they're still naked. طيب. And the women who you know wear clothes that are either see-through or clothes that are covering them, but they're exposing the shapes of their limbs and their bodies, that they fall into this category. And Allah wa ta'ala knows best. طيب. Then he mentions from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah that he said, وَقَدْ فَسَّرَ قَوْلُهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم كَاسِيَاتٌ عَارِيَاتٌ بأن تكتسي ما لا يسترها. شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية he explained that the statement of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم كاسيات عاريات this refers to the women who are clothed but their clothing does not actually cover them. فهي كاسية وهي في العقيقة عارية. so the woman she she's clothed she technically has clothes on her body but in reality she's still naked. مثل من تكتسي الثوب الرقيق الذي يصف بشرتها like the woman that wears clothes that are constricted and so even when she's wearing the clothes the clothes show the shape of uh, her body or they're, they're see-through and they allow us to see through to her skin أو الثوب الضيق الذي يبدي تقاتي خلقها or she wears clothes that are constricted and tight to the point that we can see the uh, description of her body. مثل عجيزتها وساعدها Right, to the point that, that in some cases you can see the shape of her buttocks and her arms ونحو ذلك and the likes of that. Right, and this is something that those of us who live in this country we know this is something that is very common right, among the disbelievers <coughs> that they make clothing specifically to show off the backside right, and to show off the, the shape of the woman and so forth. Allah wa ta'ala protect us. Ameen. وَإِنَّمَا كِسْوَةُ الْمَرْعَى مَا يَسْتُرُهَا So the clothing of the woman is only that which actually covers her. فَلَا يَبْدِي جِسْمُهَا And it's clothing that does not show or describe her body. وَلَا حَجْمِ أَعْضَائِهَا And it does not show or describe the shape of her limbs. لِكَوْنِهِ كَثِيفًا وَاسِعًا because the clothing is, uh, I don't want to say thick, because it doesn't always have to be thick, but clothing that is opaque, that is not see-through, and clothing that is ample, that is, you know, it's not tight on her body. This is the kalam of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullahu ta'ala. Point number four. Shaykh Saad al-Fawzan says, أَلَا تَتَشَبَّهُ بِالرِّجَالِ فِي لِبَاسِهَا Point number four is that she should not resemble the men in her clothes. Right? She doesn't wear clothes that resemble the clothes of men. فَقَدْ لَعَنَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ الْمُتَشَبِّهَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ بِالرِّجَالِ Because the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he cursed the women who tried to resemble men. وَلَعَنَ الْمُتَرَجِّلَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ And he cursed the, the women who tried to imitate the men. وَتَشَبُّهُهَا بِالرَّجُلْ فِي لِبَاسِهِ أن تلبس ما يختص به نوعا وصفة في عرف كل مجتمع مجتمع بحسبه. And the way that she resembles the men in the clothes is that she wears clothes that are specific to the men in their type and their description. And he says that every society has clothes that are designated as men's clothes, right? Any society that you go to, whether it's here in America or anywhere else, you know that every society has 
specific kinds of clothes that are specific to the men and specific to the woman, right? So whatever society she's living in, if she's trying to wear those clothes that are generally known as men's clothes, that she falls under those that category of, of women who are trying to imitate the men, right? Even though we know here, they year after year, they keep trying to blur the lines between women's clothes and men's clothes. Allahumma sta'an. Tayyib. Then he quotes from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullahu ta'ala. Again, Shaykh al-Islam, he said, فَالْفَارِقْ بَيْنَ لِبَاسَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ يَعُودُ إِلَى مَا يَصْلَحُ لِلْرِّجَالِ وَمَا يَصْلَحُ لِلْنِّسَاءِ So the, the distinguishing factor between the clothes of the men and the clothes of the women refers back to that which is appropriate for the men and that which is appropriate for the woman. وَهُوَ مَا يُنَاسِبْ مَا يُؤْمَرُ بِهِ الرِّجَالِ وَمَا تُؤْمَرُ بِهِ النِّسَاءِ And that goes back to what is appropriate for what the men have been commanded with and what the women have been commanded with. So in the case of the women, he says, فَالنِّسَاءُ مَأْمُورَاتِ بِالِاسْتِتَارِ وَالِاحْتِجَابِ دُونَ التَّبَرُّجِ وَالظُّهُورِ So in the case of the women, the women have been commanded in our religion with istitar وَالِاحْتِجَابِ With covering and concealing themselves, unveiling themselves. Right? And not having a tabarruj with duhur, not exposing themselves to the society outside and not, you know, making themselves apparent to for the people to look at them. Walihada Lam Yeshra Ulaha Rafa Sot. La Yishra Ulaha Rafa Sot Fil Adan Wala Talbiya Wala Suud Ila Sofa Wal Marwa. And he says, and this is the same reason why it is not legislated. For the women to raise their voice to give the adhan, to give the call to prayer. Nor is it legislated for them to say the talbiyah out loud, right? What's the talbiyah? When you go on hajj or you go on umrah, right? What do you say? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. Right? Or you, for example, you say labbaik umrah and so on and so forth, right? These are things that the men say out loud, but the women don't say out loud. Likewise, when you're uh, going between, you're making the rounds between the Mount Safa and Marwa in Mecca, right? The men will recite out loud, the women will not recite out loud, right? Why is that the case? These, these things that we're mentioning now, the Adhan, for example, or the Talbiyah on Hajj and Umrah, or the Duas and the Dhikrs that people make in uh, going between Safa and Marwa, these are all praiseworthy things to say, right? So why aren't the women saying this out loud and the men are? Voice, right? Because their their voice. I mean, there's there's some ikhtilaf on, on on that point about the the voice being aura. So we won't go and go that far. <laughs> but there there's a reason why the women have is not legislated for them to raise their voices among non mahram men like this, right? Because the like Sheikh Rasulullah ibn Taymiyyah says that what they have been commanded with in their appearance is to not make themselves apparent and stand out, right? To conceal and to cover themselves. This includes the voice. Right? This includes the voice. And I wanted to, to expand upon this because Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala He said in the Quran, فَلَا تَخْدَعَنَا بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَتْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٌ وَقُلْنَا قَوْلًا مَعْرُوفًا Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala He commanded the, the women that they should not be soft and pleasant in their speech. Right, meaning when they're speaking to non-mahram men, right? Not they can be soft and pleasant when they're speaking to their husbands and you know, and, and so forth. But they should not be soft and pleasant in their speech, in case the one who has a disease in his heart should be moved by desire. But they should speak in a honorable manner, right? Qawlan ma'arufan, right? Why are the women being commanded not to make their voice pleasant and and uh, uh, and soft, right? So they got to be rude to everybody. Right, so that they don't arouse the desires and those who have a disease in their heart. Right, this is something that Allah Taala wa Taala has legislated for the protection of the woman. Right, it's not a way to put the woman down. It's not a way to belittle the woman or anything of that nature. Right, as people would like to have us believe. But this is for the protection of our sisters. Tayyib. So what we were saying before is <coughs> the women have not been commanded to say the adhan out loud. Right, they've been not commanded to say the talbiya out loud. Right, so they they don't uh, they don't mention these things. Right, what else? Not correct them in prayer. Oh, wow. So now in in the salat, right, when they're praying, for example, the men and women are praying behind the imam, 
the imam makes a, a mistake, perhaps in the recitation, right? What do the men do? Right, this is about, or they can correct him as well, right? They can correct the ayah if he made a mistake in the ayah, or, you know, or if, if he, for example, made a, a mistake, maybe he went into, he forgot to go into ruku or something, you know, they can say subhanallah to, you know, to kind of catch him and remind him, and so forth, right? Why can't the woman say subhanallah? Subhanallah is a remembrance of Allah, right? If the imam makes a mistake in the recitation of the Quran, why can't the woman recite that part out loud? That's recitation of the Quran, that's praiseworthy, right? So why, why do, what do the women do instead? They clap. They clap, right? Why can't they use their voices? Women know Quran too, right? The woman can say Subhanallah as well. That's because of the voices, the attraction, the disease in the heart, and the disease in the heart, right? So Allah Tabaraka wa Taala and His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they have taken the utmost care and protection to prevent the woman from entering into this matter and not use their voices, even though if they were using their voices in these cases they would be saying something that is praiseworthy and something that they would be rewarded for, right? Saying subhanallah is praiseworthy, right? And the adhan, what do you say in the adhan? You recite the shahada, you say Allahu Akbar, right? You say things that are praiseworthy. What do you say in the talbiyah? You say things that are praiseworthy. You're saying, oh Allah, here I am at your service. This is a praiseworthy statement, right? All of these things are acts of worship and they're praiseworthy, but the women have been prohibited from saying these things out loud, Right? as a protection to the women. So the issue that I want to draw our attention to today, right? Because now, you know, we have we live in a situation where the affairs are being turned upside down, right? And and somehow some of us have, you know, gotten the idea that all of these things are not permissible, but at the same time it it is permissible for the woman to go on social media and to go on Facebook live and YouTube live and whatever else live and, you know, as long as they're covered, they can narrate videos and use their voice on videos and stuff, right? Don't don't look at me like I'm talking about some community far away. I'm talking about our community right here in Grand Rapids, right? And somehow we've gotten the idea that this is okay and that we can do this, we're gonna, we're, whether it's to promote our business, whether it's to do whatever, whether it's to just talk about whatever, that we can, you know, start narrating videos, right? And so you have sisters doing this. And you have husbands who will turn a blind eye or be aloof or maybe they're not aloof. May Allah guide them. And they'll think that this is somehow permissible, right? So we forget about the Quran and the Sunnah when we get on Facebook, when we get on YouTube, when we get on Instagram, right? And we start doing these things and we pretend like this is permissible. Not permissible to say subhanallah. Not permissible to say the talbiyah. Not permissible to say the takbirat in the Eid, right? We talked about the women saying the takbirat, the women in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would say the takbirat but they would keep their voices concealed. They wouldn't raise their voices in the presence of non-mahram men, right? So saying the takbirat, we don't do that but we can get on social media and we can talk about this and that and that's okay, right? Because we're covered, right? This is something, unfortunately that we see uh, our sisters doing today. May Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala Guide all of us and protect us. I mean, mm-hmm. Sheikh Saul Al Fawzan, he spoke about this particular issue of uh, women speaking like this, and he mentioned Al Mar'a to La Yajuzu Laha, Makhataba to Rijal, Al Ladina Laysu Maharim Laha, Indal Haja, Wabi Sultan Laysa Fihi Ithara. He said that the woman, it is not permissible for her to address men, right? And just to, to clarify, when we talk about women on social media, these are things that they're putting out to everybody in the public, right? And you think that those men that have disease in their hearts are not coming and watching these videos and listening to, to your wife and your sister and your mother and whoever else is doing these things, right? What kind of a husband would be pleased with his wife? Or what kind of a man would be pleased with his sister or his mother doing these kinds of things, right? Anyone who has a sense of ghira, a sense of honor for, his, for the woman in his family, right? Sheikh Saul Al-Fawzan, he mentioned that it is not permissible for her to address men who are not maharim, right? Laysu maharim laha. They're not maharim to her. Unless there is a necessity or a need for her to do so, and then she does it bisultan laysa fihi ithara, uh, with a voice that does not entice and attract the individual, right? Like Allah wa ta'ala commanded in the Quran, don't make your voices soft and pleasant, right? Just say what needs to be said, not that you're going to have a whole conversation you know, or like for example, you know, the sisters who will say, well, you know, I was laughing and joking with the brother who's not a mahram to me, but it's okay because my son is there. Your son is not a permission for you to have a conversation with a man who's not mahram to you, 
right? Rather, if your son is there and you have a need to say something to that particular individual, you can have your son say it. You don't have to be in that conversation at all, right? That's what your son is there for, right? Tayyib. Sheikh Salih Fawzani said that, that she, if she needs to say something to him out of necessity, she says it with a voice that does not you know, cause him to be attracted. وَلَا تَبْسُطْ فِي الْكَلَامِ مَعَهُمْ Right? And she should not speak more than what is necessary. Right? زِيَادَةَ عَنِ الْحَاجَةِ She doesn't speak with, you know, she doesn't have a whole conversation. She doesn't speak with that which is not necessary. She says what she needs to say, and that's the end of it. Right? Only what is actually needed. Sheikh uh, Muhammad bin Salih al-Uthaymeen, <coughs> he was asked, هَلْ يَجُوزُ لِلْمَرْأَ أَن تَعْمَلْ مُذِيعًا يَسْمَعْ صَوْتُهَا الْأَجَانِبِ Is it permissible for a woman to be a mudia, a broadcaster, right? Like for example, a woman who's, you know, uh, uh, an anchor for the news, right? Broadcasting the news. We won't even talk about TV, let's just say on the radio, with her voice, Right? Is it permissible for a woman to be a broadcaster where the non-mahram men can hear her voice? Sheikh uh, Muhammad bin Salih al-Uthaymeen, he mentioned a number of different points. But what we want to mention here is he says, وَلَا يَحِلُّ هَذَا أَبَدًا That this cannot be lawful or permissible ever, أَبَدًا ثُمَّ إِنَّ الْمَعْرُوفِ أَنَّ الْمَرْأَةَ الَّتِي تَذِيعْ تَحْرَسْ عَلَىٰ أَن تَجْعَلْ صَوْتُهَا وَتَجْعَلُهُ جُذَابًا Fatina. He says that this is, this cannot be permissible ever because it is well known that a woman who is broadcasting, right, she strives to make her voice soft and pleasant and alluring, right. A woman is not going to get on and, and broadcast the news, for example, in a in a you know in a rude kind of way, right. When she's broadcasting the news, or in our context, when a woman is 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 uh, getting on to narrate videos on social media. Is she making a, a, a rough voice or is she making a pleasant voice? Pleasant voice. Pleasant voice, right? Nobody makes a video, you know, uh, in, in, in the other kind of way. She don't get fired. She don't get fired. Yeah, exactly. If, she, if she was doing that, she would get fired if she's working for, you know, the news company and, and so forth. <laughs> right? Sheikh Salih Fawzan, he said, or uh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih al Uthaymeen, he says, وَهَذَا أَيْذًا مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ الَّذِي يَجِبُ تَجَنَّبَهُ that this is also from those calamities that it is obligatory for us to avoid because of what it contains of fitna. And he says, And there are men, both young and old, who can already do that. And also because the voice of the man is stronger than the woman and it is uh, clearer and more apparent, right? The point is that he's saying is that if you need to broadcast something or if you need to make a video and you know advertise something or whatever the case may be, you have men who can do that for you. You don't have to have your own voice on there, right? You have men. It could be your husband. It could be your son. It could be your brother. It could be whoever else. You already have men who can do that for you. And there's no need for you to go and put yourself out there like that and to expose your, like, yourself like that to the dunya. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala guide our sisters. Ameen. Tayyib. So that was with regards to the voice. Continuing with the kalam of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, وَلَا تَجَرُّدْ فِي الْإِحْرَامِ كَمَا يَتَجَرَّدْ الرَّجُلْ Again, he's going back to the differences between the clothing of the men and the clothing of the women. Right? So he gives the example that when we go on the uh, uh, hajj or the umrah, right? What is it that the men wear? When they're on Umrah and they're on Hajj. The Ihram, right? And the Ihram is basically uh, a lower garment and a and an upper garment, right? All of the men wear the same thing. What do the women do? Do they wear the same thing? No. Right? Showing a clear difference between what the men were commanded with and what the women were commanded with. He said, فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلْ مَأْمُورْ أَنْ يَكْشِفُ رَأْسَهُ وَأَلَّا يَلْبِسْ الثِّيَابَ الْمُعْتَادَ He says also, when we're on the, we're on the Hajj and the Umrah, the men have been commanded to uncover their heads, right? Not, not when we're not on Hajj and Umrah, that's different, right? But we're on Hajj and Umrah, the men have been commanded to uncover their heads, right? And that they should not wear clothes that are manufactured, right? They should not wear clothes that are manufactured. Right? And that means the clothes that have been, you know, made for 
you know, stitched and put together and manufactured and made by their with their measurements, right? They don't wear clothes that are you know made for their measurements. They wear just the ihram for the men. فلا يلبس القميص ولا السراويل ولا البرنس ولا ولا الخف. And so they don't wear, for example, you know, uh, uh, a kameez, you know, an overshirt. They don't wear pajamas or pants. They don't wear the the baranas, which is the which is like the 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 thing that the um, Algerian brothers wear. Right? It's like the, it's like a cloak comes with a hood and all that. They don't wear all of that. They don't wear the khufs, right? Because those are all stitched pieces of clothing. So that during the Hajj and the Umrah, the men are not allowed to wear any of those things. Up until, and then he skips ahead, up until Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, وَأَمَّا الْمَرْأَ فَإِنَّهَا لَمْ تَنْهَا عَنْ شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْلِبَاسِ As for the woman who's on Hajj or Umrah, she has not been prohibited from wearing any particular type of clothing. لِأَنَّهَا مَأْمُورَ بِالْإِسْتِتَارِ وَالْإِحْتِجَابِ Right, because the asl, the origin for the woman is that generally she is commanded to cover and conceal and veil herself. He says, فَلَا يَشْرَعْ لَهَا ضِدُّ ذَلِكَ So there is nothing that is legislated for the woman that contradicts that original command, right? Even in the Hajj and the Umrah. لَكِنْ مُنِعَتْ أَنْ تَنْتَقِبْ However, she has been prohibited from wearing the niqab on Hajj and Umrah, right? When she's on Hajj and when she's on Umrah, she doesn't cover her face, right? That, that's one difference. وَأَنْ تَلْبِسَ الْقَفَازَيْنِ And likewise, she doesn't wear gloves when she's on Hajj and Umrah. لِأَنَّ ذَلِكَ لِبَاسٌ مَسْنُوعَ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ الْعَذُ وَلَا حَاجَةُ بِهَا إِلَيْهِ And because those are manufactured pieces of clothing, and there is no need for her to wear those while she's on Hajj and Umrah. ثُمَّ ذَكَرَ أَنَّهَا تُخْتِيَ وَجْهَهَا بِغَيْرِهِمَا عَنِ الرِّجَالِ And then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he went on to explain that Outside of the Hajj and the Umrah, she does cover her face from the men. Uh, and then he went on, and then at the end of the discussion, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah he says, وَإِذَا تَبَيَّنَ أَنَّهُ لَا بُدَّ مِنْ أَنْ يَكُونُ بَيْنَ بَيْنَ لِبَاسِ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ فَرْقٌ يَتَمَيَّزُ بِهِ الرِّجَالِ عَنِ النِّسَاءِ He says, so with this it becomes clear uh, that there are differences between the clothing of the men and the clothing of the women. And that this, these, these things that we, that we have mentioned, these are differences that distinguish, or the clothing is, is different, which distinguishes between the men and the women. And with regards to the clothing of the woman, then it is clothing that conceals and covers her and veils her, and that accomplishes the goal of the religion. Uh, of keeping the woman covered, which is the basic command or the origin with regards to the woman's clothes or with regards to this topic. وَتَبَيَّنَ أَنَّ اللِّبَاسِ إِذَا كَانَ غَالِبُهُ لِبْسَ الرِّجَالِ نُهِيَتْ عَنْهُ الْمَرْأَ Also it becomes clear that if the particular clothes, if those are generally known to be men's clothes, then she has been prohibited from wearing them. Right? If whatever society you're in, if there are certain clothes that are generally known to be men's clothes, then the woman is prohibited from wearing them. فَإِذَا اجْتَمَعَ فِي اللِّبَاسِ قِلَّةُ السَّتَرُ وَالْمُشَابَهَ نُهِيَ عَنْهُ مِنَ الْوَجْهَيْنِ And then also, if those particular clothes, they don't cover her properly, right? they don't cover her properly and they resemble the men, then now they have been prohibited from two angles, right? from the aspect of not covering her properly and from the aspect of uh, being resemblant to men. وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ And Allah knows best. And that's the end of the Kalam of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And then the last point that uh, Shaykh Salih al-Fawzan mentions as the guidelines for the clothing of the women. أَلَّا يَكُونُ فِيهِ زِينَةٌ تَلْفَتْ الْأَنْذَارِ عِنْدَ خُرُوجِهَا مِنَ الْمَنْزِلِ That the clothing that the woman wears, it should not have adornment that draws the eyes when she leaves the house. Right, The clothing should not have zina, adornments or designs or things that are made to specifically draw people to look at her when she leaves the house, right? لِأَلَّا تَكُونُ مِنَ الْمُتَبَرِّجَاتِ بِزِينَ So that she is not from those women who are mutabarrijat, who are adorning themselves or who are exposing themselves with adornment and design, right? Unfortunately, even in you know some of the uh, 
stores that are that are run by people who are upon the sunnah you know you'll see you know these uh jilbabs and so forth with you know gold designs and embroidery and so forth that catches the eyes and these are things that are not permissible for the woman to wear the woman who's trying to be upon the quran and the sunnah with the understanding of the salaf al-salih right not to mention those hijabs and those uh those jilbabs that come with you know things like gucci and all this kind of stuff on top of it right designer clothing and these are all things that are made to attract the uh, the 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 sight and they're all made to make people notice you and to look at you and these things all fall into a tabaruj they all fall into the woman exposing herself because they go against her basic command to conceal and to veil herself when she goes out Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala knows best right not to mention that the other things that we've seen for example now they have something they call a a, a bur, uh, burkini right like a like a bikini but it's a burqa, right? This this is a real thing, right? This is a real thing, right? And the, the, we may laugh about it right now, but sisters in this community are aware of this, right? So they made clothing, which they say that is clothing that you can wear and you can go out for a swim and stuff. You know, you go out for a swim and what happens when you get wet? The clothing clings to you, even though it's not, uh, uh, it's not shara, it's not legislated to begin with because it's already exposing the shape of the legs and so forth. But now, when the woman goes into the water and she comes out, what happens to the clothing? Shows it sticks. Everything. It sticks to the body, right? It shows everything, right? This comes from people who have no understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, no understanding of what the woman have been commanded with, and we we pray that our sisters will not fall into the likes of these deviations. Allah Taala a'la wa a'lam. So, inshallah, that that's where we'll stop today. We have more discussion on the issue of the hijab. And the meaning behind the, the hijab and the, and the proofs for it and the benefits of it. And inshallah, we'll leave that for, uh, not for next week, but the week after. Right? So next week is going to be the Eid, inshallah. But we'll stop here. If uh, anyone has any questions or anything that uh, needs to be clarified or corrected, inshallah, we can take that now or we can kind of keep it if we need to go into detail and we can bring it in the, in the next uh, lesson, inshallah. Is it like times? Who, like the women? Yeah, women and men, like, like after migraine or something like her, is that true? Yeah, for, for the children and so forth, yeah. For the women in general, though, uh, for after maghrib, yes. But but for the women in general, the women should only leave the, the home if there is a need, where they need to go out. Right? Allah wa ta'ala said, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّ That they should, you know, remain in, in their homes. You know, one of the things that the, the ulama advise is that, you know, one of the things the husband should strive to do is to to make the home a place that is pleasant for for the woman so so that she likes to be in her home right whatever whatever the the woman wants to do as far as decorating the home and doing the home the home is her domain let it let it be her domain right the men has to have to go out to the masjid they have to go out to work they have to go out and do everything else right so one of the things that they advise is you know the the the, the home is the domain of the woman anyway let her let her organize the home decorate the home do whatever she wants to do and you know, let it be the place where she loves to, to stay because that will help her to remain in the home unless she has a need to go out somewhere. Right, but inshallah, we'll go into to, to more detail about that as well. So we have some questions from the sisters also. Inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to deal with those in some detail uh, tomorrow. But inshallah, also, if you want to text me that, we'll, we can go into more detail as well. Tomorrow? Uh, not tomorrow. Have one. Uh, week after next week. The week after... Next week. So as we said, next week, we're not going to have um, any classes on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. So as to give people time to prepare for their Eid and spend time with their families and, you know, do all the things that we can do on their Eid uh, this year. Tayyip. So inshallah, we'll, we'll end there. Subhanakallahumma la ilaha illanta astaghfiruka wa atubu.